Hi there, welcome, welcome to Home Keepers. How wonderful to be here, and even more wonderful to know that you're out there. God bless you, and thank you for all of the good things that you send our way, whether it's uh, through the United States Post Office or email or whatever. Your words of encouragement really, really just keep us going, and we appreciate it, and we want you to know that. And if we have new viewers today, don't let it be your last time, um, because no matter what age you are, I want you to really pay attention to my guest today because we're getting close to the time when school will open uh, for some schools just a few days and this is just the first week in August and so I have a real expert here today on public schools and he's served in many offices uh, within the public school system and also he is now the executive pastor of the Great Calvary Church in Clearwater, Florida and his name is David Rice and before we, uh, the show started I told him I said in my estimation maybe the greatest minister anywhere is that Christian that's in the public school system. And we want to uh, really put a spotlight on that. Whether you're a grandmother or a mom or anything, I just really want to jolt you uh, that we've got to pray for this system. And uh, for any parents, you be involved, honey. You be there every time the teacher asks you to be there and know what's going on in the school, know what's going, what they're reading and what kind of uh, classes are being taught. And so we have the perfect guest today to uh, tell you his experience in many of the offices of the public school, and we're glad he's here. And um, I was going through a magazine, you know, getting a pedicure one day, and I see this this uh, article with raspberry biscuits, and I, <laughs> I said to the gal who was doing my toes, I said, can I tear this out? And she said, yes. So we're gonna fix you biscuits with raspberries in them today. Kind of odd, but, but they'll be good. Um, but before I join her, I want to again offer you the book uh, Devotions for Difficult Times. And I have a feeling if I could speak to everybody watching me right now, there's something uh, that you're going through that is on some level uh, difficult. And you know what? God's Word has the answer for all those things. And this book has brought those answers together that uh, the topic can be a difficult time and then what God has to say about it. That is really worth having around your house. So um, it's for you, for any, for your gift of $20 to the program. And you can use your uh, credit card, your debit card, 800-229-0059, or the address is on your screen. And that gift of $20 will keep us uh, on the air. So uh, thank you in advance for that. The um, orders are already coming in for those. And hello, hello. Hello, hello. Um, Susan told me a little secret. Yes. You want to tell the secret. Uh, the self-rising secret? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we didn't have self-rising flour. <laughs> I didn't realize it when I made the drop biscuits this morning, so they're a little flat. But this batch will have it because Susan made it. So you just take regular flour and you add a cup of flour, a half a teaspoon of salt, and a, a teaspoon and a half of baking powder and okay. you can make self-rising flour so and it sounds like the world's coming to an end it's thunder thunder in <laughs> Florida so I have that in here mm -hmm. I'm gonna put in a third of a cup of sugar I'm gonna put in some salt more salt and baking powder because that's what the actual recipe calls for, uh, for. so we didn't have the self-rising flour so but we made it Susan knows how to make it yes she I'm sure she googled she, she it knows. <laughs> she googled it so we're just gonna get this mixed up and then I have um, a Am I supposed to do something? Yes, please mix that um, egg up, and mm -hmm. then that's pretty much all you're doing. <laughs> oh. We have a pan with What part. is this? That's going to, after I put the, them oh, okay. on here, then you brush it over. Okay. Okay, so then I have cold butter. But don't you think that raspberries and biscuits are a little weird? Uh, yeah, a little weird. Odd. I think we'll like them, though. Yeah, I sent it to a friend this morning. They said, um, I don't know if you should defile biscuits with raspberries. <laughs> <laughs> well, I... Uh, I wanted some clotted cream for them. Yeah. Which is what you put on scones. So I went online and uh, there's so many ways to make it. Make clotted cream. Some of cream. them are so difficult. Yeah, we don't want difficult. It would be worth yeah. it. Others though, the recipes really didn't sound like the pure English clotted. Yeah, so you're just mixing this cold butter in. Mm -hmm. You can do it with your hands. You can do it with the pastry. Mm -hmm. Blender, and then we're going to put in buttermilk. Mm -hmm. Well, first we're going to put in the raspberries so they get coated so they don't all stick together. Mm -hmm. So let me get this back. I assume this would work with um, 
other berries? With other berries, yeah. I think so, yes. But um, Stephanie, our girl who always works way ahead of time, we already have shown one thing she's doing for next Christmas. Oh, yeah. And so we're, what are we, August? August. First week of August, yes. Yeah, but see, some people would feel they're behind because I started reading things to buy for Christmas in July. I feel so behind this year because usually I'm almost done by now, though. You know. Oh, well, shame Yeah, so, so what have we got? So we got I went to a nook and cranny workshop <laughs> last week, and I made these beautiful candles. Okay, let's see. Candles. They are up to my they hips. They are so cute. That's, they're up to my waist. That's how tall they are. So, yeah. uh, would that be 36 inches? That's right. all this yeah. about? Yeah, probably. Yeah, right around 36. They are darling. Aren't they so cute? So, where do you put them? So, I'll put them either on my porch or in my foyer. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We'll see when Christmas rolls around. Well, they really are Aren't they cute. adorable? I, yeah. And I, you can't tell, but the flames, I put um, glitter. I put oh. gold glitter. So, this is buttermilk. And I'm just gonna mix this up, and it's it's a dry because they're drop biscuits. It's a, it's a dry mix, you know. It's a thick, dense mix. And they're definitely drop. That you don't. Yeah. You don't roll anything out. Nope, just drop. My mom made great biscuits. Did she? You know, uh, I've told the audience how she lived to be a hundred, and I'd go see her assisted living, and she yes. said, "You know, I never was much of a cook." I said, "Mother." She made the best fried chicken. And she said best. some funny things, though, when you were there, didn't she? <laughs> oh, she was hilarious. She, I need a little more buttermilk. Yeah, my sister uh, was thanking her for being such a great mother. Yeah. And she went on and on. Sharon was kind of teary, and my mother said, boy, was I stupid. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so one time, though, didn't she say something about you didn't take care of her, and it was you, or something like oh, that? Yeah. <laughs> well, she had advanced dementia. She lived to be 100. Yes. We were walking down the hall, and... Um, one of the workers was coming. I was with mom. She says uh, to the worker, says, come here, I want you to meet my sister. Oh. And, <laughs> and she introduced me as her sister. And she says, you know, Arthelene put me in this place, and then she left town. <laughs> I thought, boy, am oh, I glad to be your sister and today. And it was you. Okay, okay, so you just drop these on. It makes 12 biscuits. And then you take an egg wash, and you wash it. And then you sprinkle a little. And then you just sprinkle a little sugar on it. Well, friends, here's a, here's some finished ones. They look, they really look good to me. I think they look good. Now it's a little flat, but yeah, you think the other these that we're making I now? I think they may be a little bit well, more fluffy. Tell me what you think. Of okay. It. Mm. Let's see. That egg wash really makes it yeah. look crunchy. And a little um, mm. clot, clotted cream on it. Mm -hmm. Be great, like a yeah. fancy scone. So, thank you. Would probably want these, mm -hmm. um, and they're free. The recipe is free. Email's the best way, and uh, we'll send it to you that way. If not, send us an envelope with your address on it and your stamp, and we'll get them out to you. And these are called uh, raspberry drop biscuits. Yep. And they came to you by way of my pedicure. So yes. <laughs> Makes them special. <laughs> Stay with us. I want you to meet Pastor Rice. If you would like a copy of today's recipe, you may send your email request to artheline at rippy.org, or you may write to us at the address on your screen, and in doing so, please include a self-addressed stamped envelope. We thank you for being a part of our Homekeepers family. Well, it's my privilege to introduce to you the executive pastor from Calvary Church in Clearwater, Florida. Uh, it qu has quite a resume. I'm going to have to read it. Pastor for 17 years he, with a master and a doctorate and also work in the public school as the football coach, the math teacher and dean of students and also human resources. You know the whole gamut, don't you? I have, I have tried to learn it all. Yes, yes, I have, Arthur Yes. Um, you left the pastor for a while to go into public school. How did that happen? Well, there's no simple answer to that, obviously, uh, Arthelene, but if I felt that God was calling me in a different direction, uh, and that direction turned out, it, it evolved over time. I had to do some exploration, but ultimately I felt that God had called me to almost a missionary capacity uh, within my local public school system. And, and there I remained for more than 11 years. Um, 
I said, like I said at the top of the show, there's probably no greater mission field at all than uh, for a Christian to go into a, a situation like that. And uh, I think you have to be very careful because all the public schools are not alike. Some of them have more of a community heart. Others are dictated totally from the federal government, which usually doesn't turn out well. Well, you said a lot <laughs> just there. Uh, and to, to pick your first comment, there's no greater mission field in many ways. Uh, that is true, certainly here within the United States. And if you think about it, who among us in this country is more vulnerable than poor and underprivileged children? Mm -hmm. And what institution besides the public school system touches every single one of them for the duration of their young life, for mm -hmm. at least 13 years from K through 12, mm -hmm. oftentimes two or three years prior to that through the Head Start program, they're spending six hours a day, 180 days a year under the care of the public school system. If we can, as followers of Christ, exercise some influence mm -hmm. in that process, you're talking about a mission field, absolutely. And the beautiful thing about this mission field is you see these kids every single day. Every single day, and all day long. It's almost, uh, maybe by osmosis, but it's almost like a discipleship program well, with your own life. You made mention earlier uh -huh. about um, the different kinds of public schools. And that's important to remember. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes I hear followers of Christ talking about the public school system as if it were a monolith, and it's not. Mm -hmm. Every school is different, and every school is composed of men and women, many of whom are our brothers and sisters in Christ. Mm -hmm. We have so many principals, so many teachers, so many support staff working at schools all across this area and all across the country mm -hmm. who are committed to leveraging their influence in the lives of students mm -hmm. Uh, for the glory of God. Now they have to do it carefully uh, because there yeah. are rules that uh, flow down from the federal level that govern what they can say and do, but they're striving every day to demonstrate the love of Christ to their students and their students' parents in a way that can make a lasting difference. Now I have a, a son-in-law who is public school teacher and... God bless him. Yeah, for many years and he uh, he has told me in this area, I'm in the Tampa Bay area, a lot of teachers are quitting, uh, they're retiring early. Uh, your situation had more of a community feel that you might not ever get in mm -hmm. an area like this. And also to back that up, there was a big article in the uh, Tampa Times just a few days ago about how teachers are just bailing out. Um, and some of it's from the federal government getting their nose in everything. It's a national epidemic, what you're talking really? about. Really? Teachers leaving the That's profession. That's sad. Uh, and it happens at a variety of levels. We have young, idealistic young people who enter the profession because they want to make a difference mm -hmm. and they find it intolerable and quit after a year or two. And then we have pe uh, veterans who are retiring earlier than they plan to because they've grown disillusioned. And you're right to a certain extent about the degree that federal control has a negative influence mm -hmm. over local public schools because education is fundamentally a function of a community. It's Amen. about parents who want to see their kids prepared for life. Mm -hmm. The federal government is ill-equipped and unprepared to educate the children of a given community. It is up to the parents of that community to invest heavily into their school system to make sure their kids get the best possible educational experience. And where that happens, we do have strong public schools. Where it doesn't happen, parents find other, other venues. We have a school yeah. at Calvary, uh, Calvary Christian High School mm -hmm. is one of the best evangelical high schools in the country because of the investment that uh, so many parents have made over the years mm -hmm. to make sure their kids get the best possible education and preparation for life. Well, here's how radical I am. I think they ought to shut down the Department of Education in Washington, D.C. I agree. Oh, good. I agree. I, and you're, I think, you're the expert. I think schools should be governed at the most local level possible. Now, you, you just mentioned something um, there that I, I pray that any young moms or grandmoms, you know there's more than a million children in the United States being raised by grandparents. Mm. And... Um, and that is the community involvement. Well, who's the community? Come on, it's the parents. And from teachers I've talked to, 
it's very hard sometimes to get a teacher parent meeting. It's so one of the great frustrations. We found a problem. Yeah, it's one, one of the great frustrations that teachers all across That's the awful. country are facing it's is awful. that they can't get any support. When I was growing up, when you were growing up, if I got in trouble at school, <laughs> I was in trouble at home. Uh, if, I did, if I performed poorly at school, I was going to have to answer for it at home. In many cases, that script has been flipped. And if a kid gets in trouble at school when he goes home, the parent sides with the child against the school. If a kid's underperforming in school, the teacher tries to get support at home, the parents don't want to be bothered with it. Now, that's not a universal truth. Obviously, there are millions of parents in this yeah. country who love their kids and are deeply invested. Some, sadly, though, or not. My mom always said, what did you do? Yeah. <laughs> it was yeah. just her first question. Yep, absolutely. And um, when, when we look at the schools across America and the difference, but there are some schools in the Northeast and in, in uh, urban areas where it's survival for the teacher. You're right. You're right. I mean, and it, from and it, here to here. You're right. And I don't want to, to belabor the point unnecessarily, but the issue always is going to come back down to the involvement of the community, which, as you say, means the involvement of the parents. Mm -hmm. Where the parents are invested, you have strong mm -hmm. schools. Where the parents are not invested, that leaves a void into which flows the, the, the more federal organizations, yeah. the, the, the yeah. Department of Education and the teachers' unions. They flow into that void, and they begin to control the curriculum and processes at that school, and they're just not equipped to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, you went from the pastorate into the public school system. I did. Totally, completely qualified. But going from this community to this one, were you shocked on any level or were surprised at what you confronted? I became a public school teacher in January of 2006. It was the middle of the school year. I took over an eighth grade math class. And uh, it was the greatest learning experience of my entire life. Really? Because I realized, I, I had always taken for granted that every child everywhere was loved and supported by his parents or her parents and that they were going to be deeply invested in the welfare of that child. And I learned that that is not the case, mm -hmm. sadly. There are millions of children in this country who don't really have a lot of support at home. It's mm -hmm. a tragedy. Mm -hmm. And it, you, I'm going to go back to the theme you brought up initially mm -hmm. of, of the mission field. Mm -hmm. What better place for a follower of Christ to leverage his or her influence for the benefit of another mm -hmm. than to do so for the benefit of a child who lacks proper parental support, which will enable them to be adequately prepared to face life as an adult. Yeah, I've had, um, we have a colleague here who left, she was here several years to go to the mission field and she went with kind of a medical organization, but she started a little school over there. Yeah. And I think that school could change the country yeah. eventually. Yep. Yeah. And more and more uh, Christian parents are exercising their freedom to explore other educational opportunities, even though it sometimes costs them in terms of money and time. Uh, you know, we've got families at our school at Calvary, Calvary Christian High School, that uh, make great sacrifices, yeah. but they do so because they know you only get one chance. You raise kids, I raise kids. It, th that time passes more quickly. Mm -hmm. If you're a young parent, that time's gonna pass more quickly than you know. And you only get that one opportunity to speak into your child's life and make sure they're ready to face the rest of their life with a strong educational background, but also a strong moral and spiritual foundation from which to explore the world and figure out who you are. Uh, so you've got to get it right. Yeah. Um, I don't know why it is the older I get, I'm more astounded at the poverty and ignorance around the world when there's so much available. The Bible says in the last days, knowledge will increase. And mm -hmm. I think that's every kind of knowledge there is, yeah. good, bad, and uh, science and space and everything else. And to realize the millions and millions of people who can't read. Yeah. Um, my belief is go to the mission field, get them saved, and then educate them, yeah. for heaven's sakes. At what, are, are we starting to learn, I hope, after half a century of experimenting as a culture 
uh, in the United States and throughout the Western world, we've been experimenting with this idea that the nuclear family isn't as important, right? Yeah. That marriage isn't as important, that raising children isn't as important. Um, we're starting, we've sown the wind for half a century and we're starting to reap the whirlwind. Yeah. A, a child is not going, to the point you're making, all the information that has ever existed is one mouse click away. Uh -huh. But that will not raise or educate a child. Mm -hmm. It takes the investment of a mom and a dad who are committed to each other and committed to the task of raising that child with all that they need to be prepared to face life. Mm -hmm. it's, it's such an indictment. And, and then to see where we began with uh, one-room schoolhouses, with mm -hmm. parents paying the teachers, and uh, they knowing the value of education, and then to see that when we did have a public school system, the first book they learned was scriptures from the Bible. We've got some of them right here yeah. in the uh, building. And to see now where uh, actually in kindergarten, first grade, second grade, they put this suggestion in a child's head, someday you're gonna feel like a boy, someday you're gonna feel like a girl, and all this transgender things that they are pushing, 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 on children, they're way too young to ever yeah, process there's it. No, there's no, no greater, clearer evidence of our collective insanity as a culture yeah. that we've begun the process of promoting that uh, transgender agenda. Mm -hmm. and, and here's the thing. What a grown person does is, you know, that's, that's not my concern. But somebody's got to stop at some point and think, what lessons are we teaching to a child. Mm -hmm. Do we really want to say to a 12 year old, mm -hmm. it's up to you to figure this out yeah. all by yourself yeah. without That's reference insane. to the wisdom of the ages, the collective wisdom of the whole history of mankind can be disregarded by a 12 year old yeah. boy yeah. in order to make those determinations. It's, it's madness. Now I understand the system you were in and you wore many hats mm. uh, while you were there that it did have more of a community feel to it maybe than a school in a huge city. My wife and I both lived and taught school and coached athletics in a small town in north central Florida, a town that we, we to this day dearly, dearly love and in a school system that we dearly, dearly loved, a great school system with three great principals, elementary, middle and high school, three great principals, lots of great teachers, strong community involvement and Teachers and teachers and coaches investing uh, in in the lives of the kids in that community, and you know, sh don't tell anybody, but there's there's coaches and teachers that are praying with kids, that are speaking truth, eternal truth into those kids' lives, not because they have some political agenda, but because they love those kids, mm -hmm. and they know what those kids need mm -hmm. to be successful in life, and they're giving it to them. Well, I, I a lot of times when great people, successful people write a book or make a speech or something, they acknowledge a teacher. Yeah. One, I had one teacher in high school that I felt really encouraged me. And I had a, you know, I came from a stable family and all, but it still, at this late date, stands mm. out in my memory. And uh, my, thankfully, my great-grandchildren are all either homeschooled or in Christian schools, and I'm, I'm so thankful for that but they're still growing up in Sodom and Gomorrah. Mm. That's where the church and the family have to be so strong to uh, educate them against what's happening yeah. in our culture. Yeah. My pastor, who also happens to be my brother and my boss, Dr. Willie Rice. Yeah, and he's uh, been on the program. Yeah, he's, uh, he's a friend of the program. He uses the analogy of the Babylonian exile of the ancient Hebrews. Yes. We're, we're living in a time of spiritual exile. And in a time of exile, it is doubly important to emphasize the distinctives that make us as followers of Christ who we are. And we must double down on our commitment to raise, making sure that our kids and our grandkids grow up with an understanding of what it means to follow Christ and to spread his love to the whole world. That they don't grow up with the Babylonian Yeah. Um, Values exactly that boy. That is such a great point because I have felt for quite some time that uh, America is we're, we're living in a whole different system now 
I, mean, I guess you call it Babylonian and all, but we're still here. Yeah. And the Lord has something for us to do. Education being a primary mm -hmm. uh, goal, the education of our kids and grandkids. We cannot just trust anybody to do it for us. No. As parents and grandparents, we have to be willing to invest every day in the process of making sure that the kids we love are learning what they need. Parents are the number one educators, really. By far. Did you ever have any materials come to you? You taught psychology, didn't you? No, ma'am, I was a math teacher. Okay, where did I read psychology? I thought I read that in your uh, uh, resume. What about any books or videos or movies that could come in? Uh, because there was a big article in uh, the Tampa Times just, I think, last week where people were welcome to speak up because there were smutty novels, you know, that they were given to the kids to read, things you wouldn't have in your own house. Yeah. And also, I know that there is, you know, through this federal government thing, there's an effort to keep information from the parents that they don't let the kids bring Sadly, information that is home. True. Sadly, that is true. Uh, there, there is a strain of thought. And again, I want to be very careful with this because remember, every public school is a unique entity. Right. And the public school system consists of individual human beings, many of whom are followers of Christ and are leveraging their position of influence for His glory no broad to show brush. His love. No broad brush. Mm -hmm. But there is a strain of thought that carries a lot of weight at the, at the level of the federal government in the Department of Education and in the teachers unions, which are run from the top down, mm -hmm. uh, that parents are kind of, they're kind of the enemy. They're kind of a, a yeah. roadblock yeah. to the proper development mm -hmm. of their uh, children. And uh, if you're a parent, that should alarm you and you better be vigilant. Yeah, and to put it bluntly, stick your nose in there. Yeah, absolutely. Be Christ-like, be kind, be all those things. but. That's your child. Yeah. That's the most important thing. Boy, you've, you've shed, in a few minutes, you've uh, really given us a good overview and a reminder that every, every situation is, is different and that's where we need to understand and fit into our own situation. And, and I don't know about all you, but I pray for my kids every single day. And I pray for all the great grandchildren and the grandchildren and all. And I God say, God, direct them and correct them when they need it. But whatever, that's something you can do every day. And that's pray for your children because God does answer prayer. And we're out of time. But please join me next time remembering there's no higher calling than that of a homekeeper. God bless you. If you should miss a homekeeper's program, you can catch up by going to www.ctnonline.com. Click on CTM Programs and then on Homekeepers.